that's an account of his life. So verse 1 of chapter 11 says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you've entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, What are you doing loosing the colt? And they said to them, Just as Jesus had commanded, and so they let them go. So they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so Jesus went into Jerusalem and then into the temple. We'll stop right there. So this is what we call the triumphal entry. This event was prophesied. It was spoken of by Zechariah the prophet, uh, specifically that uh, Israel would recognize their king, that their king would be coming humbly to them. The presentation of the king to the nation of Israel, that he would come humbly, and Zechariah specifically said that he would come riding on a donkey. So this is a fulfillment of a prophecy given nearly 500 years before Jesus was even born, uh, that his entrance as the Messiah coming in would be uh, riding on a donkey. Uh, the people recognizing uh, this moment uh, by singing a song, this, the words of the song, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's not a spontaneous song that no one's ever sung before. It's an old song. It's about a thousand years old when they're singing it. You guys know any thousand year old songs? It's a pretty old song. I don't know if they had pompadours, you know, a thousand, but I mean, this, this is an oldie. You know, you got to go to the oldie station. It's right out of the Psalms. It's Psalm 118. It's a song that, that is about the establishment of the kingdom of David. The word Hosanna is a word that means uh, save now. It, it's, a, it's a cry. If you were in the ocean, you got caught in a rip current, and you, know, you realize, wow, I don't know if I'm going to make it back in, and you're fighting the current, and the waves are getting you, and you're trying to get the lifeguard's attention to come rescue you, this would be what you'd say if it was a Hebrew lifeguard. Hosanna! <laughs> Hosanna! Hosanna! I'm over here! Hosanna! It's the idea, I need help, save me. It's a cry for salvation. It's also a cry of salvation in that you got saved. So if you're a Niners fan, you might be saying, Hosanna, you know, today, or a Broncos fan, Hosanna, you know, wow, they didn't come back, you know, they didn't, you know, win. It's, a, it's we won, we, you know, salvation, we got saved. So it can be a cry for salvation or a cry of salvation. So you'd know which it is by the context. So in this context, it's probably both. Here are the people saying, Lord, you got to save us, Hosanna. You know, you can cry salvation, but really Jesus is the only one who can save you. Who's going to save you from yourself? And you might be struggling with something and you say, I think I need some help. And you go see a psychologist and they can listen. I mean, at best, I think men might be able to do a good job of diagnosing. Yeah, you've got an anger problem. Okay, that's why I came here. I already knew that. <laughs> Well, you, it's because you have bitterness towards your family. Well, yeah, I knew that when I came in too. Oh, well, here's some methods of how we deal with it. Okay, well, I can try to put those into practice, but my heart needs to change. Who can change? Can you change my heart? Do you have medicine for that? Is there something that I can take that will make me a different person? Because I take that. It's in a bottle. You just take this once a day, and you'll be a different person. Well, no one can save you. And there's medication that will make you a different person, but not for the better for the worse. You can medicate yourself and ruin your life. I'm not talking about maybe prescription medication, but there's lots of different medications that people take from alcohol to all different kinds of drugs, mind-altering drugs, change your personality, but it's never for the better. Jesus can actually change you. This, this prophetic psalm, a thousand years before the Messiah would come, that the people would be crying out salvation, and here he is, the Savior, your king is coming to you lowly, riding on a donkey. And so all this is happening, it's prophesied, it's, it's the, the, 
the only time really in his ministry where Jesus allowed himself to be acknowledged as king. And you can see the wisdom of the Lord, though, because in, in the, the, the sort of uh, fulfillment of this prophetic thing that's so important in his kingdom, with that is a very practical experience that his own disciples will have. Jesus is always doing way more than one thing at a time. One of the really fun and enjoyable things about following the Lord is watching him weave together so many different things and, and putting together things you think, how in the world? Who could ever have done that? You know, you, you know, we might be able to weave together two or three things. You might be able to braid someone's hair, you know, okay, or do a complicated thing, four or five strands, put it together. But boy, the Lord, when he puts something together, so here it is, all these prophecies given hundreds of years apart and hundreds of years before he was born, and it's all coming together on this day and then right in the middle of the story are two disciples that are learning something about following God. A couple of disciples. Hey, guys, I need to enlist you for a project. Okay, Lord, we want to serve you. What is it? I want you to go steal a donkey. <laughs> well, it's not stealing. They gave permission. But go, go, you're going to go into this village, and then you'll just see a donkey. Take it. I mean, think of all the questions that you might ask at that command. Well, how will we know it's the right donkey? What if we get the wrong one? And we're just going to walk into the town that's just going to be sitting there? There'd just be, there's so much uncertainty with the command. It would require a real step of faith. And so it's sort of a learning experience for these guys. It's, it's so interesting how the Lord will combine things that are just completely sublime and eternal and amazing and, then, and with the, the most mundane the most basic kind of a thing. Two guys get sent on a project to learn how to trust God while prophecy is being fulfilled. While something David wrote about a thousand years earlier is being fulfilled, two guys are right in the middle of that very story learning how to trust God and, and how to follow the Lord and, and knowing that, hey, whatever Jesus tells us to do, it'll happen, just like he said. We can trust him. Do you have a few things like this happen to you in your life? And what happens when the Lord then starts to stir you up? You think, hey, the Lord's done this. We've done this already. He already remember, we went, we didn't know what was going to happen. We found that donkey exactly right where he said it would be. Just looking at Nick, I was reminded of when we were in uh, New Zealand last year, a year and a half ago. And, you know, we'd never been there, driving on the wrong side of the road, trying to figure out where we're going and uh, having fun. And the doing that almost crashed, you know, I almost crashed us a couple times. At the beginning, I, I got, definitely got better over the time period. Not immediately, but over time. And uh, we left Auckland and drive, drove like wherever we were going, two hours or something, not having any idea where we're going. We drive into this town, and we're going to meet Dave somewhere, and he goes, I'll be by this supermarket. And we pull in looking for a place to park, and we park the car. Nick gets out of the passenger seat, and he turns around, and he goes, you're never going to believe this. Look at that sign. It's Calvary Chapel. We drove to the Calvary Chapel in Rotorua, straight there. Not even knowing that there, really that there was a Calvary Chapel in Rotorua. We're meeting Dave at a supermarket or something, or some big uh, box store that was kind of a landmark in the town. And here, here you know, what an encouraging thing to go, to just, it's a small thing. You might say, well, yeah, well, that was a coincidence. I don't think it was a coincidence. Fly the 20 hours, cross the date line, jet lagged, get in a car, Drive where you don't know where you're going and drive directly without, really, we made one wrong turn, but other than that, directly and parked on accident in front of the church where actually after we met Dave, he was going to take us. So we called him and said, hey, bro, uh, we're not going to meet you at the supermarket. Just come over to the church. We're there. He's like, you found it? Like, we drove to it. We didn't find it. It found us. Like, we, we just drove and parked and it was there. You know, you, you, what happens in your life when you have things like that happen and you think, you know, the Lord's doing something, the Lord, and the Lord will just work these things out, and you learn to trust Him. If God tells you to do something, guess what? He can handle it. He's never stressed out. God's nails are never bitten. You know, He doesn't, to use the anthropomorphism, you know, God obviously, I don't think He has nails to bite, but God's not stressed. He's not confused. He's not messed up. He, if, he, if He tells you what to do, then you can do it. These guys are learning that. So we have this kind of beautiful picture of how so often the things of God, where the most grand thing is happening, the highest level, the Messiah is entering Jerusalem, fulfilling the prophecy. Israel is having her king come. And in the middle of the process are two guys that are learning to trust God. 
So if, you're gonna, if anyone says anything, you just tell them the Lord needs it. I've already taken care of it. Don't worry, they'll let you have it. Okay, we'll do it. And off they go. It's a, just a great story, a great picture. And when he arrives, verse 11, it said, when he got to Jerusalem, he went into the temple, and he looked around at everything. And as the hour was already late, he went out to, was late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. So they didn't stay in Jerusalem during that week. Uh, they would walk out of the city, go to the little village of Bethany. It wasn't too far to walk, and uh, they would spend the night there. Uh, the, you know, later in the week, they're spending the night on the Mount of Olives. That's where he gets arrested. So not staying in Jerusalem, but leaving, coming in for the day, ministering during the day, and then leaving in the evening and staying um, at different people's houses or camping out, as he will at the end of the week. So he checked everything out. Israel has received her king. They, they shouted the hosannas. And now the next day, as he comes in, verse 12, it's an interesting story. The next day when they came out from Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing from afar a fig tree that had leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but the leaves. It was not yet the season for figs. So there's two seasons, technically, for the figs. There's the main fruitfulness that will come after the leaves, but there's early fig. It won't be the full harvest that you'd have. That's, you, you wouldn't be able to earn a living if you had the smaller harvest. But if the trees have produced leaves, there should be an early uh, fig harvest, the small one. The main one will come later. So it's early in the season. The leaves have come, and so there should be the early figs. So something's wrong with this tree. If it's produced leaves, it should have produced some figs, but there aren't any. There's been a, there's been a failure of its life. So... He sees it. There's, there's no fruitfulness there. And so verse 14, in response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. This is an interesting story because we'll see in a moment, uh, verse 20, in the morning as they passed by, so the next day, they saw the fig tree and it was dried up from the roots. He cursed the fig tree. And by the morning, it was the next day, 24 hours, the thing's completely dead. It's dried up from the roots up. The tree's a goner. The leaves that were there are gone. The tree's withered away. Something miraculous happened. And what's unique about the story is that it's the only time in Jesus' ministry that he did something that was completely destructive. The only other time when something's destroyed is when he cast the demons out of the man in uh, the Gadarenes who the, they went into the pigs and the 2,000 pigs ran off the cliff into the sea and they were destroyed. But a man was saved. So um, there is a destruction, but it, there was the salvation of a human being. In this particular case, it's a tree that's just dead. Now, the point of it, and to understand it, we have Jesus coming looking for fruit, and there's no fruit. And it, there has to be life, and the byproduct of life is always fruit. So if someone says, I'm alive, and there's no fruit, then they're not alive. In this particular case, there's a tree, and you'd say, well, the tree looks good. It's got leaves. Yeah, but there should be fruit there. If there's leaves, there's got to be fruit. If you've got a tree with leaves, hasn't produced any fruit. It's cursed. And in the particular context, look at what's sandwiched in between the cursing and then realizing it's cursed. Look at verse 15. As he had come to the tree looking for fruit, he comes to Jerusalem. Verse 15 says, they came to Jerusalem, and then Jesus went into the temple. What should he have found in the temple? What do you think you should find in the temple of God? People seeking the Lord. What should the spiritual leaders be doing if people are gathered seeking the Lord? Well, the spiritual leaders should be helping them find the Lord. They should be serving them. They should be teaching them. They should be encouraging them. They should be helping them. They should be clearing out the obstacles that hinder you from understanding who God is and making a straight path, you know, making it easy to understand who God is, not complicated. You shouldn't have to overcome your spiritual leaders to understand who God is. They actually should be making it easier for you to understand who God is. And yet in this particular case, when he comes into the temple, as he had seen it the day before, and now coming to the tree and there's no fruit and it's cursed, now he comes to the temple. And what we see in the tree is an, is an object lesson. Jesus coming to the nation, looking for its fruit. What happens in this last week of the life of Jesus is what John would say in John chapter 1. He came to his own and his own didn't receive him. We'll see the rejection of the Messiah by the nation. But you know what else we'll see in this week? We see the rejection of the nation by the Messiah. 
It's a judgment. Judgment's happening. He's going to tell them, this house is going to be destroyed. You see these beautiful buildings? Not one will be left upon another. Not one stone. It'll all be destroyed. The, the, this uh, gospel's going to go to all the nations. It's a pretty heavy judgment. So they're rejecting him, but in their rejecting him, they themselves are going to be rejecting. So uh, God will still work in the nation. He has a plan for them in the last days, but uh, for this generation, you know, these things are all going to come upon them. So he comes and he looks at the, in the, the temple and he deals with it. Verse 15 continues. It says, he began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he wouldn't allow anyone to carry anything or wares, any, anything through the temple. This would have been very intense. The temple's very public. It's, it's the Passover week. So we're in the last week of his life. That would be past Palm Sunday, we call it. It's the beginning of that week. So you have literally hundreds of thousands of people that have come from all the different countries where the Jews have been scattered. They've all come back to Jerusalem. Josephus, the Jewish historian, says that around the time of the first century that these Passovers were attended by two million people. Let's say he's exaggerating by 100%. That's a million people. <laughs> Jerusalem's not a huge place. The Temple Mount, can, you can have a lot of people crammed in there, but you've got to imagine this really large open area, the outer porches of the, of the Temple Mount, as, as Herod had refurbished it, uh, just teeming with people. And then you've got the places where people can buy and prepare and, and uh, present their offerings for the priests. So there's a lot of activity, and, and a lot, it's all commercial. It's, it's commercial in the sense that people have commercialized the seeking of God. Hey, if you want God to work in your life, just send me some money, and he'll work in your life. Hey, we've prayed over these handkerchiefs. Just make a generous offering. We'll mail you one. Like, you got to be kidding me. Or, you know... Hey, send in your offering and, you know, sow your seed. You know, you plant the seed in this ministry, you plant it, God's going to give it back to you a hundred times. Manipulating people and using people's desire to have God work in their life, using people's desire to have a relationship with God, to please God, to offer to God, because that's, that's in the heart of the people of God. They love worshiping the Lord. They want to worship the Lord. But to take advantage of that, to make a gain off of them financially, is evil, and it's wrong. And it's still happening today. It, and it happened in Jesus' day. That's what's happening here. He's cleansing the temple. My house is supposed to be a place where people meet God. It's not supposed to be a place where you're raking them over the coals. The money changing, why would you need to change money? Well, you need to buy things, maybe. What do you need to buy in the temple? What are they doing in the temple? Well, they're offering sacrifices. Well, we've made it more convenient for you. So we have sacrifices that you can buy off of us. You don't have to, you know, God said you bring your own lamb, but we, you know, we've got lambs already. They've, they've changed the worship of God so that they can make a gain. They're catching the people when they exchange the money, and then they're catching them when they have to buy the product. And it's all for worship itself. It's, it's actually the very act of worship has been commercialized. It would be as if we said, hey, what songs do you want to hear? And, you know, it's like a jukebox. You want to sing and worship? Well, which ones do you want? If you want to hear that one, it's one of the top ten. It's going to cost you. And everybody has to pitch in. to get. I mean, it's like, you think, well, no one would ever do that. They're doing this. <laughs> They're changing money. Imagine that. It's just crazy. But it's happened. It, they've got the control, and they're very wealthy. And Jesus goes through this whole area, and he goes crazy. One man. This is, this is one of his miracles, <laughs> I would say. Something is happening where these guys don't jump him, they don't stop him, they don't clo no one clotheslines him or, you know, horse collar tackle. They, he, just, he just goes crazy and <laughs> throwing stuff down, says he makes a whip out of cords and drives them all out. You can just imagine this herd of people and guys are running, tables are going over, animals are taking off, birds are flying away, and Jesus right in the middle of it. Just letting them have it. And this is what he said, verse 17. He explains it. What he was doing was scriptural. What gives him the right to do it? Look at this sentence. Verse 17. Isn't it written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? What gives Jesus the right to do it? My house. Do you have the right to go in and cleanse the temple? It's not your house. 
But if it was your house, you have the right to clean your own house? I hope so. I think your wife thinks you have the right to do it. If you walk into your house and you go, man, I hate these kitchen cabinets, you can tear them all out and get yourself some new ones. If you come over to my house and you say, I hate these kitchen cabinets, and you start tearing my cabinets out, well, I say, hey, what are you doing? You're like, hey, these cabinets are no good. They got to get out of here. You've had these cabinets for 15 years. They're starting to fall apart. I'm getting them out of here. Well, it's my house. You don't get to decide that. Well, I've just... I just decided I, you know, the Holy Spirit told me. Do you, well, the Holy Spirit didn't tell me, and it's my house. I would think that since it's my house, the Holy Spirit might tell me. You see, here's what, here's, Jesus has the right to do this. How does he have the right? It's his house. He has the right to do that. You don't have the right to do whatever you want to do, right? Do you understand? You, you know, you, you, there's authority that's delegated. This is going to be very important because they're going to ask him about authority. So get ready for that. That'll be in the next um, couple sections coming. So my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of thieves. The temple was to be a place where people could meet God and talk to him. It's a place where you could hear from God. It's a place where you could come and seek God. Isn't that awesome? you imagine having a place where you could go seek God? We have something in the new covenant even more amazing than what they had in the old covenant. Because guess what the Bible says? You're the temple of God. So you can seek God where? You don't have to come to 2212 Cawson. You can go where? Well, wherever you are. You can seek God in your car, while you're driving, with your eyes open. You can close your eyes, you know, when you're parked. You can seek God. You can go out to the river and sit on the, the levee and watch the sunset and just worship the Lord and enjoy his creation and give him your cares. You can, you can be in a busy part of the city where people are coming and going and just fellowship and pray for your community. You can, you can worship anywhere you want because you're the temple. It's a place where you meet God. So it was meant to be a place where people could meet him, but they had taken advantage of that and they were ripping people off, a den of thieves. Now, they didn't like that. Verse 18, the scribes and the chief priests, when they heard that, they sought how they might destroy him, and they, but they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. Can you imagine how, how blown away everybody must have been when he did that? Imagine if you saw that happen. If you'd known Jesus for a while, he'd never done anything like this. He'd been to Jerusalem. It's three years of his ministry. He grew up going to Jerusalem, find him at 12 years old sitting in this very temple asking questions of the scribes and answering their questions. And now here is this manifestation of his power and his authority and no one can stop him. And he clears the whole thing out and he lets everybody know and everybody's sitting there thinking, whoa, this is, this is radical, man. This guy, this guy's serious. Everyone's astonished. The leaders can't deal with him. So verse 19, evening came. And he went out of the city. And so in the morning, as they passed by, then they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Peter saw that, and he's shocked. Verse 21, Peter, remembering that Jesus had said, no one ever eat fruit from you. Peter then says, Rabbi, look, that fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Surprise, whoa. Now think of all the things Peter's seen. Lazarus has been raised from the dead. He was in the house when Jairus' daughter got raised from the dead. He was at the city of Nain when the widow's coming out on the funeral with her son, and he's in the coffin, and they're taking him out, you know, to bury him. He saw that guy raised from the dead. He's seen how many blind people be able to see? How many lame people? How many lepers have been cleansed? He's heard all this teaching. He walked on water. He saw Jesus walking on water. He got out of the boat, and he walked on the water too. And think of all the things this guy's seen. He's still tripping out on Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus says something to the tree. I guess I wasn't really paying attention that you actually cursed it. Look, it's dead. Like, it's withered away. Whoa, man. It's funny. Jesus responds. He says, have faith in God. Assuredly, I say to you that whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and doesn't doubt in his heart, but believes that those things that he says will be done, he'll have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, 
and you'll have them. Don't be so surprised, Peter, that God can do whatever he wants to do. Be confident when you pray. He's getting at not so much the context of the fig tree and its relationship, you know, the, as an object lesson for Israel. That thing stands for itself. He just, he gets at the incredulous response of Peter. Peter's, hey, look, it happened. And Jesus said, listen, you can pray and talk to God about anything. You could even say to a mountain, go into the sea. It would obey you. Now, Jesus is not saying that we, you know, use prayer as sort of a haphazard ray gun that we just go on, you know. Well, no. The Bible teaches us lots about prayer. It says if we pray anything according to his will, he hears us. God's not going to be bound by our prayers to do something that's not in our best interest. God's in control. But the teaching here is about the need to trust the Lord, to believe. Is there something that you don't think God can do that you know needs to happen? Start praying for it. And pray believing, because God will do it. God's powerful. God can answer. He can make things happen that you never dreamed could ever happen. So whatever you pray for, believe. You'll receive it. And then with prayer is now a, a, an encouragement or a, a reminder about the necessity of forgiveness. When you're there in the presence of God, seeking the Lord for what... Uh, your need is or what the opportunity presents when you stand there praying he says in verse 25 if you have anything against anyone i love how he puts that if you have anything against anyone so what does that include everything that you might have against everyone <laughs> anything whatever it might be anything against anyone forgive him that your father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses so important for us to forgive. Jesus would want his disciples to be free from the consequences of unforgiveness and bitterness. If we don't forgive, it really begins to warp your, um, your spirit, your heart. Your, you, know, you, you get unforgiveness towards one person, and then you just become mean towards everybody. It's just it's so dangerous, and you need to be free of it. Just forgive forgive. Say, well, Lord, you forgave me for so much to forgive this person. Let it go. Don't hold on to it. Don't remind yourself of it. Don't, don't rehearse it. Don't re-remember it so many times that you remember things that never happened. That happens, by the way, to people. I call it creative memories. You remember something and that bitterness begins to tweak everything and now you're remembering things that never even happened like that. It's so devastating. So Jesus said, listen, when you're praying, if there's something there between you and someone else, you let it go. And the warning, verse 26, if you don't forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. It's interesting, whenever Jesus talks about forgiving people, he always attaches it to your salvation. <laughs> Does that bother you theologically? I mean, I think, you know, we believe salvation is by grace through faith. It's not of yourself. It's a gift of God. We've got this really great concept of grace which is true no doubt about it where sin abounds grace super abounds but every time jesus teaches on our need to forgive other people he always says if you don't forgive you're not going to be forgiven it's the only real the only real thing that he talks like that and it and it, and it just doesn't it, it's just not allowable it's not it's not allowed to be part of your life unforgiveness let it go if you're a person that holds on to things then ask the holy spirit to change your heart don't, you know, if you, if you are a grudge holder, if you're one of those people that you can remember the day and the hour, what exactly, well, I know exactly what you said. Really? <laughs> I thought you forgave me. Oh, I did. You know, and it, I don't know that you really, you, you know, let it go. Just let it go. Don't hold on to it because, hey, if you don't forgive, you're not going to be forgiven. Don't ask me to reconcile that with our theology. It's, we're saved by grace through faith. It's not of yourself. Forgiving people doesn't get you saved. I don't think I'm, well, he just warns you. If you don't forgive, you're not going to be forgiven. So there's your answer. Forgive. If we don't, then we won't have an issue. Now, starting in verse 27, we get to um, this Mark's uh, portrayal of the hostility uh, Mark, Mark tells the story so concisely. He, he really 
cuts out a lot of the details. Matthew has, has extended teaching on different parts. Luke has extended teaching in different places uh, through, the, through the life of Jesus, his, his ministry. Mark just tells the most abbreviated account. And so starting from this verse, we're getting his sort of condensed, or, or just he just sort of streamlines, hey, here's what was happening. And you'll see the response of the religious leaders. He goes through it quite quickly. They came back to Jerusalem, uh, verse 27. He was walking in the temple, and the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, they came up to him. What did that look like? That's like a gang, right? All the chief priests, scribes, elders, they're all together. Here they come. How many is it? The Sanhedrin had 70. I think, some, I think it's 70. Um, how many guys are here? Like, this is a, this is a huge, the huge porticos, Solomon's porch, and there's this huge open areas hundreds of people, thousands of people around, and uh, he's walking through, and all of a sudden, here's this delegation. What, you know, that, think of, talk about the tension. And here's what they say. Verse 28, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? I think he's already answered the question. My house is supposed to be a house of prayer. Who gave him the authority? Well, the word of God gave him the authority. This, this whole issue of authority and his answer is extremely important, and it does apply to us. In the context, obviously, they're showing that they're not under the authority of God. They, they just want to get him killed. There's all the thing happening in the context. But the teaching on authority is extremely important because we have authority as believers. And there's an authority that we have that we share one with another. And it's not something that's inherent necessarily um, in one individual that they carry around, like the Pope or something, where here's a person and they have all this authority. The Bible is our authority. What God has said is our authority. And so there's, there's a, a mutual submission. That's why Paul can write to the church and tell the church, submit to one another. Well, how do you do that? Well, we're all under the authority of God. So, you know, someone who's a leader can be submitted to someone who's not a leader, well, because of God's word. This is what the Lord's doing. This is what's happening. This is what God has said. So you have a person who's a leader who's struggling with something that God said. Maybe it's not, not really putting it into practice. Someone who's not a leader can come and say, hey, you know, I don't know. The Lord, you know, kind of showed me this, and I want to encourage you. You know, here's what the Bible says. And, you know, you've got to receive it. You don't just say, well, I'm a, I'm a leader. I don't listen. The Word of God. There's a mutual submission. But you don't have authority where God hasn't spoken. The, the pastor doesn't get to come to somebody and tell them, you know, you're going to need to talk to me before, or your elder, before you decide to make any major decisions, because we're your shepherd. The shepherding doctrine has periodically, you know, come up in, in the church since I've been a Christian. Back in the 80s, it was super popular. It doesn't work, so it becomes really popular, and then all the consequences and the fallout happen, and then it's not popular for a long time, and everyone forgets, and then it becomes popular again, and then there's all the fallout. But someone doesn't have that authority. You get to have your own relationship with the Lord. You, have, you know, you seek the Lord. There's one mediator between God and man. It's the man Christ Jesus. But also, neither do the people have the, the ability to come and exercise authority over the pastor or the leaders. We have freedom. There's great freedom. The thing with freedom is people like to have their own. They just don't like other people to have it. Over the years that I've been serving the Lord, I've had so many times where I've had people that got mad at me because I didn't lay a trip on the church. <laughs> you know, you need to make these people, make these people, what do you, you know. Someone's decided what needs to happen and they want someone to dictate to the other people. I think, look, at if God put that on your heart, you go do it. Well, I don't want to do it. I'm not called. Well, then why are you bugging me with it? I don't think I'm called either. People like to take authority in areas where they don't have authority, and then they don't want to have the authority of the Holy Spirit or the authority of the, the I mean, by the Spirit, I mean through the Word of God. It's God's Word. Hey, if you see your brother, and he's, he's a, you watch him in the market, and you see him taking stuff, and he's putting it in his pockets, and he's stealing, you walk over to your brother and go, dude, you're stealing. Knock it off. Like, thou shalt not steal. Hey, don't judge me, man. The Holy Spirit's leading me. The Holy Spirit's not, the Bible... Listen, the word of God's the authority. You don't get to say, well, the Holy Spirit's telling me it's okay to steal. The Holy Spirit's not telling you it's okay. The Bible says it. So the word of God's the authority. Now, what about when 
What about when someone's doing something and it's not in the scripture? Well, then, it, then there is a position, then there is leadership. You know, you can't go to someone else's house. Like, say, say I come over to your house and at your house, everybody takes their shoes off when they come to the front door. And I get to your house and I see all the shoes by the door and I say, oh, do you want me to take my shoes off? And you go, yeah, that's kind of how we do it. And I say, I don't like taking my shoes off. And I walk right into your house. You have the right to go, hey, bro. <laughs> that's very disrespectful. Well, I'm sorry. You just need to get over it. You know what? You just need to leave. Hey, what are you going to tell me I take my shoes off? You, you see, who? listen, there's a lot of times when, you know, you don't have that authority. You just humble yourself. Away. Okay, that's your rule. We're at your house. That's your rule. All kinds of churches make... They'll, they'll have a policy, or they'll have a rule, they'll have a, something that God's put on their heart. Hey, that's their thing. Follow the rule. What's the big deal? <laughs> They're not taking away your freedom or taking away your life. They have the right. Now, now if, it's, if it's something that goes against what the Bible says, if they say, hey, here's what we do. We steal from people, so come on in. <laughs> you know, we don't break the law. We don't break the law of man or the law of God. When it's a scriptural thing, we're all under the scripture. Everybody's accountable to everybody. When it's something that's past that, like you could come into the church tonight and say, hey, Rich, the Lord gave me a song to share with the church. Okay, well, you share it with me, and you sing, I love the Lord. And I go, ah, the Lord might have given you that song for you to enjoy. You and the Lord together. God bless you. You know, it sounds like a good song. I'm not sure you're supposed to sing it. No, I'm really sure I'm supposed to sing it. I'm not sure you're supposed to sing it. You can't tell me what God's telling me to do. Oh, yeah, I can. You want to bet? You're not singing that song. Well, or you're quenching the Holy Spirit. No, I don't think I am. If God wanted you to sing that song, he'd, he'd put it on my heart that you're supposed to sing that song. But he's not telling me. So, so it's important that we understand authority. Author this authority issue is extremely important. Jesus has scripture. He's got, he's got who he is. And the scripture says, and Jesus is acting in light of the scripture. He's doing what the Bible says. And so now they're mad at him because they've taken a position where they're saying, we're leaders and we're going to do what we want. And now the real leader's saying, I don't want that. And they're saying, who told you that you can tell us that? <laughs> well, God told me <laughs> in that sense. He cleansed the temple. Their, their temple's going to be destroyed. Not one stone left upon another. So the issue of authority is an extremely important issue, and it can become confusing in the church. People will take authority where they don't have it. They won't respond to biblical authority. It's, it's one of those areas that can get, it gets messed up coming and going. They'll, they'll have leaders that will act in ways taking authority over the people's lives that the Scripture doesn't give them that. They have people doing that to the leader. I mean, it's, just, it's one of those things that's extremely important to get a good grasp uh, of the Word of God's the authority and then when we're into matters that are not um, you know, specifically addressed in the word of God or by principle, then you're, there's leadership that God's put into place. And the Bible says, submit to your leaders. So if you don't like it, then, then you, you, know, you find other leaders that you, more, you bear witness with what they're doing. You say, well, I don't know I bear witness with this. I'm gonna, I'll think I'll find some different leaders. But you're free to do that too. Yeah, praise the Lord, go for it. You know? I think uh, it's a very important thing. And uh, it's an issue here in this particular context. So they don't really care about authority because look what, how they answer Jesus' question. Look at verse 29. He says, let me ask you a question. You answer me and then I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, is it from heaven or from men? You answer me. They reason among themselves and they said, if we say from heaven, he'll say, why didn't you believe him? If we say from men, well, they feared the people for everyone counted John to have been a prophet. So they said to Jesus, we don't know. And Jesus said to them, well, then neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. They're not interested because they don't really care about authority. What do they care about? Money and their position. <laughs> That's why they have a beef with Jesus. It's not about him cleansing the temple. It's about him impacting the bankroll, the, you know, the money that's flowing. Then he told this parable. And you have to go back to Isaiah 5. Remember, Isaiah 5 is the story of a vineyard. So Israel being a vineyard and God having a plan for Israel and the vineyard being spoiled. So this is a biblical 
like these guys know the Bible. They know what the Word of God says. This uh, vineyard story is going to remind them immediately of Isaiah's prophecy or statement. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat and built a tower, and he leased it to vine dressers. He went out into a far country. At the vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from those vine dressers. And they, they took that servant, they beat him, and they sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent them another servant. And they threw stones at him, wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully treated. He sent another, and him they killed, many others, beating some and killing some. Therefore, still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them last, saying, they'll respect my son. But the vine dressers said among themselves, this is the heir, come, let us kill him. The inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Then he asked a question. Therefore, what will the owner of that vineyard do? He'll come and he'll destroy the vine dressers and he'll give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read this scripture, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. That passage is exactly the same context as the Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're right within a few verses of each other in Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected is the chief cornerstone. He tells this parable, taking a, an image or a metaphor, an analogy from their scriptures. Hey, they know this is about them. And now he extrapolates it further out. Hey, this is what you guys were like in Isaiah's day. Here's, you've continued on just like your father's until this day. God's now sending his own son, and you're going to kill him. And so what do you think is going to happen? God, you know, you're going to be destroyed. God's going to deal with you and discipline you. Now, verse 12, they understood it. They sought to lay hands on him. But they feared the multitude, for they knew that he'd spoken that parable against them, and they left him and went away. And they must have been furious. They wanted to take him out. And they just look around, there's too many people. There's just thousands of people everywhere, and they're all, get him, Jesus. You know, they're, 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 Jesus is speaking to the, these, the, the people of God know corruption when they see it. They know these guys are corrupt. They've been grow, they grew up with it. And now here's this rabbi who's teaching and helping people and loving people and telling the truth. And now he's, it's a standoff with these leaders and he's, he's telling them to their face and, and they're getting, you know, it's, it's a radical thing and the people are supportive and these guys are watching it and then they can't do anything and they're just so mad. Then they come to him, they're trying to trap him. Verse 13, then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. These two words, Pharisees and Herodians, these are parties. These are groups within Judaism in the first century. The Pharisees are very conservative, ultra-conservative. They're uh, the, the ones who are promoting the rabbinic Judaistic traditions as they were in the first century, very legalistic, very uh, exacting in every application of the law, at least outwardly. The Herodians are more of a political party, they're, they're followers of Herod. Herod's not even really Jewish. He's part Jewish. He's a Roman appointee who has sort of a, he likes religious things, but he's a, he's a, he's a very pagan man, very ungodly, politically savvy like nobody's business. I mean, the, guy, the guy's evil. He's, uh, he's married to his, or, you know, shacked up with his brother's wife. I mean, guy's just wicked. And so you've got, you, you know, this is like saying the ultra-conservative party and the ultra-liberal party got together and they came to ask you a question. You know, you can imagine in, in this country, you know, you get a phone call, hey, we want to get a comment and uh, we have on the line the uh, head of the Republican Party and the head of the Democratic Party. They both have joined together. They want to talk to you. Uh-uh. <laughs> you know, you get two guys, these guys never agree on anything and they've come to talk to you, you're in trouble, man. So here are Pharisees and Herodians never together and they've come to trap Jesus Notice verse 14. It's a great application of the proverb. He who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. So always watch out when someone's buttering you up. What do, what do you do with things that you butter up? They get devoured, right? They just take a nice roll, nice big roll, and just put some butter that bad boy up. What's about to happen to it? Chomped. So when you ever see anybody gets out the knife and they start buttering you up, just get ready for the teeth. They're coming. So they say, look at this, this is a comedy, verse 14. They came and said to him, teacher, 
we know that you're true. <coughs> and you don't care about anyone. <coughs> you don't regard the person of men, but you teach the way of God in truth. Really? I don't think you believe any of that. You're lying. It's flattery. You're awesome. We, you know, you always tell the truth. If they don't believe a word he says, they're not following him. Here's, their tr here's the trap. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? Framing the question. You only have two choices. Either we pay or we don't pay. What do you say? It's a trap. Jesus, in the most amazing way, answers. He says, why are you testing me? He knows, says, knowing their hypocrisy, he said, why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. So they brought it. And, they, and he said to him, whose image and inscription is this? And they said, it's Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were marveled. They marveled. <laughs> they thought they had him. Who, how are you going to answer this? If he says, don't pay, they walk right across the Temple Mount to the fortress of Antonio, tell the Roman governor, we got a guy, he's, over, he's wanting to overthrow the Roman government. And he's right here, come get him. He's dead. If he says, you need to pay the taxes, then the heartfelt you know, commitment nationally to this Messiah, people are going to hate him because everybody hates paying taxes. Not just you, everybody who's ever lived, who's ever paid a tax hates it. Jesus answers with a sentence, just in one sentence, uh, a principle that can be applied and illustrates perfectly the, the believer's relationship to the government. The disciple of Jesus has a relationship with the government. Here's the summary. You give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. So you've got those Federal Reserve notes. You're using them. Hey, Caesar wants them. He requires some. You give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But what's more important than that? You give to God what belongs to God. Caesar doesn't get to tell you a whole bunch of things. Caesar doesn't have the right to say a bunch of things I think that currently our Caesar is saying. Our government as it exists right now is intruding into areas that it has no authority. And it's making decisions that are incredibly detrimental to the nation and making a stand uh, in areas that it can't speak. It doesn't have any, any authority to speak. So when the government tells you to do something and God's told you to do something else, that trumps. But if God hasn't said anything about it, God says obey the laws of the land. So you give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but you give to God the things that are God's. Your heart, your soul, all your strength, your mind, every, you know who you are, that belongs to God. You give to God the things that are God's. Beautiful, beautiful priority, simplicity in the one sentence. They're trying to trap him, and we get a fantastic teaching on the relationship with government. They marveled at that. Then verse 18. So round three, what authority? Round one, bam, it's a knockout. Round two, they get, you know, send some other guys in. He throws them over the ropes. They're out of the ring, you know, on their head. They got a trap. Should we pay taxes or not? And then he wipes them out. Now, here's the next group comes in to take a shot at him. Some Sadducees. So we had Pharisees and Herodians. Pharisees, ultra conservative. Herodians is sort of more of a political party, very, you'd say if they're followers of Herod, probably, you know, out there, so to speak, as far as it relates to uh, Israel. The Sadducees are the very liberal religious leaders. They controlled the priesthood at the time of Christ. So these are the ones that are behind the whole uh, materialism. They're very materialistic, rationalists. They, they're, they're the high priest family, the most wealthy family in Israel at the time of Christ because they're making so much money off the people in worship. They don't believe the Bible. They believe the books of Moses, the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books. They believe that's the word of God. The rest of the Old Testament, they don't think it's the word of God. They don't believe that there's a resurrection. They don't think there's a heaven. They don't believe in angels. They don't really believe in spirits. They don't believe in a spirit world necessarily. They just sort of see things as very materialistic, so they're very, and they're very liberal. They capitalize on that, taking advantage of the people who do believe in spiritual things to rip them off. So they come, and look at their question. It's very interesting. Mark lets you know that a little bit of the background. Verse 18, he said, Then some Sadducees, and he adds, who say there's no resurrection. Interesting. 
They don't even believe in the resurrection. What do you think their question's about? <laughs> the resurrection. It's a carefully crafted question that's designed to make fun of someone who would believe in the resurrection. It's a question that's designed to point out an absurdity about the resurrection so that, of course, no one would believe in it. Science teachers do this all the time. They'll carefully craft a question to make it so that you're an idiot if you believe in anything other than evolution. But it's a twisted, weird question that com completely confuses the issue. That's, what happen that's what's going to happen here. The question is, is crazy. Look at verse 19. Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. That is in the law. And that was because uh, the, the land of Israel was passed down from father to son to father to son. So if a, if a man died without having any children, he would lose his place in Israel. So there was a provision in the law, and it's weird, okay, it's weird because we don't have anything like this and it would be strange to have this happen but your your brother's you know he dies he's married you're supposed to get his wife pregnant you know his widow now and that that kid that's born will take your your brother's name and he'll be take your brother's place so we won't lose any of the families in israel that's what the law said now here's their statement verse 20 it's a hypothetical situation now there were seven brothers the first one took a wife and died, and he left no offspring. The second took her, he died. Neither did he live, leave any offspring. The third one, likewise. So all seven had her, and no offspring. And then last of all, she died. So now they're all dead in heaven. There they are, all seven brothers, and now the woman's been married to every single guy. That's awkward. Verse 23. See, there's the absurdity. It's a hypothetical situation. Create an absurdity. Aha, what are you going to do about that? In the resurrection, verse 23, when they all rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as a wife. <laughs> the clown, they call it the clown theory of persuasion. It's very effective. Make fun of something. Mock it. Don't, you don't argue against it. Don't give proof against it. Don't, don't, don't go to what, you know, there's evidence. Just make fun of it. And uh, it's very effective, very effective in persuading people. Now look at Jesus' answer. Verse 24, very important his answer. He says, Are you not therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? There's what's wrong with the rationalist. What does he not know? He doesn't know what God says and he doesn't know God's power. You're mistaken about this, you Sadducee because you don't know God's word and because you don't know God's power. How much trouble is a person going to be in if they don't know what God's word is? Oh boy, you're going to be in big trouble, aren't you? If you don't have God's word, what are you going to be left with? Satan's lie? <laughs> hey, what do we have to combat Satan's lies? What do you use to extinguish every fiery dart of the wicked one? What, is, what does it say? Ephesians 6. And take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish every fiery dart of the wicked one. The shield of faith, what does that mean, shield of faith? Is faith just it's like a force field? Or Faith isn't magical or something that exists by itself. Faith means believing what God said. If you think of the shield of faith, it means do you have any pro Satan's attacking you. Do you have any promises? If Satan condemns you, how do you use your shield? You say there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm defended. If Satan says, you'll never be able to do this, you're too weak, God's power is made perfect in weakness, <laughs> defended. You take up the shield of faith by applying the word of God, trusting the word of God. It protects you from the devil's lie. If you don't know the scriptures, what do you have when the devil comes at you with a fiery dart? You have a fire. <laughs> you don't have a shield. If you don't believe the scriptures and the devil comes with a fiery dart, your head's on fire. And then he comes with another one, and then your chest is on fire, and then your leg's on fire, and then you're burned up. You get toasted. You don't know the scriptures, and you don't know the power of God, the rationalist. Everything's natural. Oh, I'm so sorry for you, the rationalist. You don't know the scriptures of the power of God. Then he says, in verse 25, and he would know. Here's a little insight about heaven, you guys. Verse 25, when they rise from the dead... They neither marry 
nor are given in marriage, but they're like the angels in heaven. There's your answer. Whose husband is, whose wife, whose husband, what's, in the, in the resurrection, all that confusion, Jesus said, you're not married in heaven. That's why when we get married, we say, till death do us part. Till death or the coming of the Lord. We'll be married on this life. What God has joined together, don't let man separate. But that's an earthly relationship. And when we're in heaven, we're not married. Now, some people, I've met people where they've said, well, I don't know, like, I can't imagine not being married to my wife, and how could that be? And we're so intimate, we're so close. Listen, do you think that you could have, is there something in your flesh that hinders your relationship with your wife right now? Are you the perfect husband? I mean, are you selfish ever? Do you ever, I mean, is there, is there do you come up, you know, fairly regularly with the reality that you have two selfish people that are sharing a house? Is there conflicts? You can have the best marriage of all, and you're still going to kind of have conflicts. Guess what? When you're in heaven, there's no flesh. I, I guarantee you, I will have a much better relationship with my wife without a flesh. <laughs> she'll be happy. Guarantee you, she'll like me better. She'll see me in heaven. She'll look at that. No flesh. I go, yeah, isn't that cool, Gina? I made it. She'll say, I like you better. <laughs> you know, there's, you know, th there's an earthly relationship, but then when you're in heaven, there's, there's perfect oneness with God and with everybody. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be awesome. So you're not, heaven's not less than earth. Don't think, well, what if I'm in heaven? I'll never even see her. What if I don't even know her? That's not, come on. That's not how it is. Heaven's not less than earth. So not, there's no marriage in heaven. Then, and don't anybody shout amen either when I say that. I always, I'm always afraid to say that because, you know, there's always, amen, you know, whoa, it'd be hell if it I know I was in the wrong place, but I was still married. Verse 26, now he deals with their bigger issue, their rationalism. They don't believe in the resurrection. He's going to show from the scripture. He said, concerning the dead that they rise, haven't you read the book of Moses in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him, saying, I'm the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. So deals with the, by what authority? Deals with the taxes, deals with this hypothetical, weird, stupid question. It's not even honest. And then teaches in each case, in each situation, he teaches an amazing message about the issue that's underlying it, authority and the relationship with the government and the resurrection of the dead and what their real problem with rationalism is. It's a radical passage. At that point, verse 28, one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he'd answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And this seems to be a very honest question this guy has. Jesus said, the first of the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. So the great commandment, love God. The second one goes right with it, love your neighbor. The whole law hangs on those two things. And verse 32, the scribe said, Well said, teacher, you've spoken the truth, but there is one God and there's no other but he. And to love him with all your heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. There's a little insight there. He's, you know, to, to obey is better than sacrifice, the Bible says. Here's a scribe. He knows the word. He's, he's seen Jesus answer so well, and he's blown away by the answer. He says, Lord, I want to ask you about the great commandment. And, and so this guy's thinking through all this stuff, and Jesus then says in his response, verse 34, seeing that he answered wisely, Jesus said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And then after that, no one was asking him anything. Verse 35, he asks them a question or makes a statement, as Mark tells it, uh, rhetorically, I guess, asks the question. Uh, in the temple, he said, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, now in English, we have two words, Lord. Do you see that? But notice that the first Lord is all capital letters, capital L, capital O. So it looks different in your type font. The all capitals Lord is the name of God in the Old Testament, Jehovah or Yahweh. And, and it's the name I am. So this is the name of God in the Old Testament. 
The word translated as Lord is the Hebrew word that means Lord, master. So David's saying the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, says to my master, now wait a minute, who's David's master? But Yahweh. So we have a conversation between the same person. <laughs> the Lord said to my Lord, and it's a reference to the Messiah, because look at what he says. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So that's the Messiah. That's the son of David, the descendant of David. The Bible's really clear. The descendant of David will be the Messiah. He's the son of David. But David calls him Lord. That's the point Jesus makes. Verse 37, therefore David calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? The common people heard him gladly. This issue can't be understood unless you remember the in the first century culture in Israel, it was very strongly a patriarch, the, male, the oldest male. He's, the, he's sort of the king. He's the Lord, in a sense, of every family. So there would never be a time where he would call his son his Lord. There would never be a, a frame of reference where you'd have the dad refer to the son or the grandfather refer to the grandson and say, that's my Lord, because he, ha he has a position of being the preeminent male. So David's son, of course, he's the son of David by birth, Jesus. But how can Jesus be his Lord if he's his son? Well, we know the answer. Jesus is God and he's man. He's the son of David. He's born of a virgin. He's Mary's son, descended from David. He's David's son. He's David's Lord because he's God. So we know the answer to the question. They didn't know the answer to the question. And then... Just a really brief teaching warning about these religious leaders. We had a very extended chapter, um, Matthew chapter 23, where Jesus, uh, this was a much longer warning. Mark gives us just a couple of verses. Verse 38, he said, beware of the scribes. Now listen, he conditions it. Scribes are people who love the word of God and are copying it and they're teaching it and they're spreading it. There's nothing wrong with that. But beware of these kind of scribes. Now, what is it that you're looking for that you want to watch out for? Beware of the scribes who like to go around in long robes. So if you see any guy with long robes, watch out for him. What does that mean? What is a long robe? What's the deal? They love the greetings in the marketplace. They love the best seats in the synagogue and the best places at feasts. What is it about these guys? They love to put themselves in front of people. Whenever you find somebody who wants to put themselves in front of people, they want to be called by a special title. They want to be recognized as being better than everybody else. That's the person you have to watch out for. Now, it's interesting about the ministry of Jesus. You could be caught in the act of adultery. You could be a notorious sinner in the community. You could be a tax collector that everybody hates who's ripped off almost everyone. And Jesus will warmly receive you. In fact, he might call you to be one of his 12 apostles. You know, in Matthew's case, he was a tax collector. Calls him right out of a tax booth to be his disciple. Jesus is so gracious and so loving. The one place where he gives anybody a tough time is a religious leader or a religious person who's putting themselves in a place of preeminence and, and putting themselves above other people and taking advantage of people. When That's something that's a non-negotiable with Jesus. There's zero tolerance policy for it. The harsh... The only harsh rebuke that anybody gets in the New Testament from Jesus is a religious leader who is loving the greeting, loving the preeminence, wanting to advance himself, wanting to draw attention to himself, something we have to not let get into our hearts. And what they do, because their heart's messed up, verse 40, they devour widows' houses, so they're taking advantage of people, and for a pretense they make long prayers. These are people that pray, and their praying is to be heard by men. Now, I want to encourage you, if, if when you pray, you get nervous about praying, and your blood pressure goes up, and your heart's beating, you're getting ready to pray out loud with some other people, and you're thinking about what you're, you just don't want to sound like an idiot. We all understand that, because we all feel exactly the same way. Uh, there's, you know, you got to grow out of that or whatever. Th that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the person that's going to pray so that everybody will realize that this person's more awesome than everybody else in the room. They're praying so that the people at the table will realize that the spiritual leader at the table is them. They're choosing words. They're going to pray in a certain way to make everybody know I'm the man because I, I outpray all of you because I'm awesome. And as long as we all, it's that clear around our table or clear in this room, then, you know, we'll all be good. 
praying to, so that people will recognize how spiritual you are. It's evil. <laughs> Jesus said, watch out for people that do that. Now you think, wait a minute, am I supposed to be judge people when they're praying? No, you won't have to judge them. It'll be obvious. You'll hear the bell ringing in your head when the Holy Spirit's going, watch out for that. <laughs> you hear the ding, 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 whoop, 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 whoop. The, you know, the siren will go off in your head and you'll say, whoa, I'll be praying for my bro. Or maybe the Lord, Spirit will prompt you to talk to him and say, hey, man, you doing all right spiritually? <laughs> you know, what's going on? Watch out for it. They're going to receive a greater condemnation. And then the end, we looked at this this morning in great detail. Jesus was there in the temple opposite the treasury, and he saw all the people putting their money into the treasury. Many who were rich put in much. And one poor widow came and put in two mites, which make a quadrants. The two mites is essentially nothing. It, you can't buy anything with it. It's a, these tiny little copper coins and... Uh, it was her offering. It was all that she had. Many rich people were putting in all kinds of money. Jesus pointed it out to his disciples, and he tells you that God's economy is different than the world's economy. He said to them, verse 43, Assuredly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who've given to the treasury. What makes her offering different is the spirit and the heart out of which it's given. They all put out of their abundance, but she's put in out of her poverty, she put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. This doesn't mean that for your offering to count, you have to give every single thing that you have. The point that he's making is that her offering is from her heart. It's to the Lord. It's a sacrificial gift. It's given in faith. It's, it's given for the glory of God. And it's, and, it, and it's meaningful to her. And she's expressing her devotion to God by giving it. The other rich people who are giving are giving to draw attention to themselves. They had set up that giving area. Each, each of these boxes, there were several boxes in this giant room, according to the historians. Uh, it, was, it was this area, the temple treasury, where they would receive the offerings, and they actually called the boxes the trumpets. Interesting, especially when Jesus, when he talks about giving, says, don't blow the trumpet. Imagine people coming and taking these big bags of coin and pouring them into these boxes and the noise that it would make and people seeing it, announcements being made about who's giving what. Here comes so-and-so they're going to give. And this poor widow, no one notices her. She puts in next to nothing. And Jesus said it was more than everybody else. So here's something that we have to understand as believers. The economy on which heaven operates is not like the world's economy. One million dollars is not more than one dollar. Jesus can take the two mites. He takes this woman's story and he uses it to inspire millions of people. How many people have heard the story of the widow and her two mites? And how many people have been inspired to give and sacrifice? How many people who have nothing are encouraged that God sees the little bit that they can do and, and honors them for it? How many millions of people have been encouraged by her? Truly, she did give more from several perspectives, except for if you think that coins mean something. If you think that coins mean something, then she didn't give more. But that's not what the kingdom of God is all about. Her love, her sacrifice, her humility her faith expressed in this gift has done more for the kingdom of God than all those other gifts put together. So um, that gets us to chapter 13. That's where we'll end tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how you are so wonderful. We look at this section where you answer so masterfully so many difficult issues. Men scheming and planning to destroy you, trying to trap you in your words, and you answer everyone so in such an amazing way, so powerfully and so insightfully. Lord, you're so, so good, and we love you. We love you, and we worship you, and we want to live for you. Help us, Lord. Pour out your spirit on us and help us to live for Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.